Hello, everyone. Welcome to another NLP Insider Live show, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are here live every other week for 15 minutes to talk about everything NLP and AI with industry leaders. I'm David Talby, the CTO of John Snow Labs, and today I'm super excited to chat with Margarita Colangelo, who is a leading AI analyst with a strong focus on AI in healthcare. Margarita has published over 400 articles covering innovation and forecasting in healthcare. Today, she'll share her insights and predictions for AI in the industry with us. It's great to have you here with us today, Margarita. Thanks, David. It's nice to be here. So let's jump uh, right in. So uh, you, you, you're an active thought leader and on the board of uh, some of the leading companies in the healthcare industry. Can you tell us a bit more about you, yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I started working in Silicon Valley in 1988. And I um, all the companies that I worked for were all startups and they all were using really emerging technologies. And then in, um, and they made like the first uh, Java application that was actually used in the real world and things like that. And then the first AI company that I ever worked for was 20 years ago. It was Nuance um, Communications and they, um, I, I was part of the first uh, technical support team. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first real world experience working with AI. And even from back then, 20 years ago, I always thought, how could we use this for healthcare? So that's been my um, interest for a really long time. And then in 2015, I started writing articles about AI and medical research, AI implementations that were getting FDA approval. And um, I've been doing that for about, you know, the last eight or nine years I've been writing about, you know, FDA clearances, things that work. And that's, um, so that's my focus lately. Super interesting. So you, you, you've published many articles covering uh, innovations and digital technologies in healthcare. What is the current trend that you see when it comes to new technologies in, in this industry? The, uh, so the, uh, if you look at AI throughout all of healthcare, um, it's used in so many different areas. And I've focused on four areas that I know a lot about. Radiology, pathology, drug discovery, and gene sequencing. So um, I'm not really knowledgeable about a lot of the other areas, but those are the areas I'm pretty, very, very confident that I know a lot about. And the, um, out of those four areas, the area that has the most FDA clearances is radiology. 75% um, of all the clearances are in radiology. And, um, but unfortunately, I, I've read other, you know, many studies analyzing cleared technologies that both have, um, you know, the CE mark in Europe and the FDA clearance in, in the US, and only about 20% of them are making a clinical impact. So in the last year, what I've really started to be interested in is, what are the AI implementations that work and are making a clinical impact? That's what I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's going to be my focus going forward because um, that's what hospitals and doctors want to know too. You know, what can we use to help us find breast cancer early? What can mm -hmm. we use to help us find, you know, diagnose diseases? And um, another area that I'm really interested in is convergence of many different emerging technologies. So advanced robotics with AI in diagnosing diseases and treating diseases, things like that. Um, so that's, I think, every year I get sort of more focused in on something that's working really well. And I think that's what's um, really exciting right now. Okay. Can you give me maybe one example of a system that you see? You know, as you say, yeah, yeah. You make you <laughs> I've been reading about something all week and it's really exciting. In fact, so I'm on the advisory board of the... Um, the University of Hawaii Cancer Center AI Institute. So it started about six or seven years ago, and it's one of the top in the world. Does it and involve flying to Hawaii occasionally? I used to live in Hawaii, actually. Oh. So before the pandemic, I was in Hawaii all the time. Um, oh. But yeah, I hope to go back. Um, but they're starting a lecture series, and every month they're going to have a lecture about AI that's doing something really um, exciting in medical research. And mm -hmm. tomorrow's the first one. And it's all about the top scientists at the University of Hawaii who are using really advanced robotics and really advanced AI to diagnose prostate cancer and treat prostate cancer. And that's the talk tomorrow. So I've been reading all about it in advance. So when I hear this incredible scientist talk about it, I'll really know exactly what he's talking about. 
So that's an example. In many of the universities all over the world, there are departments collaborating. They're doing it at Stanford and MIT and um, um, Singapore, National University of Singapore. And so that's what's interesting to me. Like at Stanford, the um, really advanced ultra high performance computing people are mm -hmm. working with the genetics people and with Stanford Hospital. And there, so there's these collaborations and they're using the most advanced hardware and the best AI algorithms, but also they're having other groups like the robotics people involved. So that's really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, you mentioned before that you say like you only have four specialties. You mentioned like radiology and pathology. And I think some people don't understand like, you know, the radiology is, it, it's bigger than the entire like higher education industry, right? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Well, and also well like, for like, I think like eight long time ago, I um, arranged the very first um, AI spotlight at a precision health conference. It was a really long time ago and no one did done that before. So I invited 30 companies and I researched all of them and they all came and um, some of them were doing AI for mental health and AI for all these other things. And I realized in order to really understand how AI can be used in a certain area, I couldn't do all of them. I mean, there's, I may actually had a chart of every area where AI could help in medicine. And then I, I um, organized them. So, you know, where can it make the biggest impact sooner? And that's what I focused on. Yep. So I actually had a method to how I was uh, reading about it. Cause you know, I read thousands and thousands of research papers mm -hmm. and there's hundreds of thousands of papers published and you can't possibly read them all. So I had to narrow it down. But then after a while you start to see a pattern of where a lot of the great research is happening. And like National Inst um, University of Singapore, they're, they have really cutting edge research there in AI. And mm -hmm. University of Hawaii, they have incredible. And Stanford, MIT. Um, so you'll notice that um, I do hone in on the ones that are working. Okay, very nice. Uh, so what role do you see AI and NLP play in healthcare compared to other industries? Um, I think I think it's difficult in, in healthcare. I think it's it's a difficult problem, um, but it's necessary. So we're we're definitely working on it. You know, I so I've been thinking about using NLP for a really long time, and it is. I in fact, when at Nuance, when I used to work at Nuance, I used to be one of the beta testers, and this was twenty years ago, and it actually worked really well. I was always twenty years ago, AI was working really well. But we weren't using it in medicine, of course. We were using it in other um, applications. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it's a difficult problem. With imaging, it's really um, satisfying to see AI advancing because it's the advances are so huge and so obvious. Like, for example, if you look at a mammogram, the human eye can only see 256 shades of gray on a mammogram. Mm -hmm. But there's 65,000 shades of gray on a mammogram. So we, the human eye, there's this <laughs> very big limitation that humans have, but AI can see all of the shades, but also it can make, um, see relationships that are really relevant um, for cancer. So there's things like that that are so exciting that are these huge um, benefits of using AI that are very clear when you look at medical imaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, agreed. What do you see as a trend in natural language processing in healthcare for the next couple of years? Um, I'm not an expert in Latin natural language processing, but um, I mean, I think that definitely we're going to see progress. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I actually probably should uh, read more about that area. I'm not that much of an expert in that area. Okay. Uh, interesting. I mean, there, there's a lot of work happening in NLP, in, in pathology and radiology, right? And just be able to understand the notes. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's a work on the images themselves, and then the works on the notes. Well, they, that probably was a big part of um, the big study that they did with sepsis, where mm -hmm. um, Bayesian Health and Mark Johns Hopkins University were able to decrease sepsis deaths by 18%. Mm -hmm. um, and this was done in five large hospitals over a three-year period on mm -hmm. half a million patients. Yep. And basically, the AI was installed in the ele electronic medical records, and when someone registered at the hospital, they were tracked from the time they registered till the time they were discharged. And the AI looked at everything, every lab node, every lab, everything. So that was probably a big, but I'm not, I have to say, if, if I ex, if I focused on that area, I would have a lot of data for you. 
<laughs> that makes sense. So if you look at AI in healthcare, and, and you, you you had to pick one thing, what, what's your one wish for where AI in healthcare needs to be 10 years from now? Oh, so my I definitely know what my one wish is. My mm-hmm. wish is that the best... Um, implementations are used by doctors in doctor's offices and in hospitals. And I read a really um, sort of it, sh- surprising report just this week, and I, I published an article about it, um, saying that, you know, there's 90 FDA approved uh, precision medicine implementations for oncology. So when someone has cancer, there's many different implementations they can use to treat them with precision medicine. But in in studies, only about 64, 64% of patients are ever given the opportunity to use these kinds of therapies. And so they, they the analysis that I, that I read showed all the gaps in clinical practice. Like why are these great implementations that are FDA approved not getting to patients? And the they specified exactly why all the different gaps from the beginning, from testing till, you know, giving the therapies. And um, that's going to be a huge problem because even if we get incredible AI applications that can do incredible things with high accuracy, if the doctors and the hospitals don't know how to use them, it could be 10 or 20 years till we get them. I mean, it really could be that long because there's, um, so many things that have been FDA approved that work well. And one of the reasons, one of the gaps is that the people in the offices don't understand how they can be used. They don't understand how to use biomarkers. They don't understand how to use the new things. And they're using things they were using 10 years ago. So see what I, so I think they're, I think all the focus is on the scientists and doing the science with AI, but I think there ha- does have to be a lot of work done at the point of care. In hot with in hospitals and with doctors, so they'll be able to use all these FDA approved AI applications. Uh, absolutely, and uh, honestly, when you said, I mean, uh, when you said that sixty four percent, honestly, I, I would have guessed it would yeah. be much. No, I would have guessed it would be lower. And it said, and this was, um, you should, I don't know if you read that article. I think I published it um, on on Monday. I just published it a couple of days ago, but um, it's it was a very in depth research about this. And it was really surprising how people just assume that if they get cancer, they're going to get precision, you know, oncology. And they don't. They really and it's don't. available, but they don't get it because yeah. somebody didn't realize, you know, that it was important or something. Some, yeah. It was usually something administrative. It didn't have to do with money or with the doctor. It was just the tests weren't done or someone mm-hmm. wasn't offered a test that was available. So that's a big problem. So I that think that's. Problem. So that's, I mean, imagine if we have hundreds and hundreds of AI applications that are available to us and they're, they are all just sitting there not being used and we don't even know. Yep. And the problem is a lot of people aren't, don't know what's available. They're not told, yep. you know, you can have all these tests. So I think that's something that we really have to work on. And I think I'm going to start writing articles about that. You know, what's available and in what hospitals and what hospitals are using the, yep. uh, the FDA cleared um applications yeah and i agree with you and uh, absolutely i think there needs to be much more work in that area you know there's one um uh, big pr- a program in singapore that's that's addressing this mm-hmm. it's um for uh, using ai to um, assess cardiology health and they the doctors in in singapore took four ai toolkits and um, integrated them into one platform and installed that in doctor's offices and in hospitals in Singapore. So they don't have to learn about every different application and it's all integrated. So the doctor gets one report. Mm -hmm. So see what I mean? Those types of software um, integration projects would be really helpful so that the people in the doctor's offices don't have to learn about all the new AI um, like screening tests that are available. They can be all integrated and it just is becomes um, very easy for the doctors. And I think that Singapore, the, the, the platform in Singapore is called the Apollo platform. It's mm-hmm. used in the three biggest hospitals in Singapore and all a lot of cardiologists use it. And the reason is because it was made um, very user-friendly for the doctors. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. I think the, the integration, the clinical workflow, uh, the education piece, Right, uh, there's, there's, there's 
It just the practical things. So yeah. Like we're also focused on the science because it's so exciting, but there's all these practical things that sometimes haven't been addressed. Yep. So Absolutely. if we want widespread adoption, we have to make it really easy for the, the doctors to use the AI, but also for the patients to know what's available. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think part of the challenge is at the end, you have to go doctor by doctor and educate people, right? Like there's no there's no shortcut, right? The, the same with any other medical procedure or, or innovation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So we'll, uh, you know, would appreciate the help. <laughs> That's what I'm going to start writing about, David. I'm going to start okay. writing about what cleared implementations are being used. And I'm actually thinking about writing the names of all the hospitals and mm -hmm. just, and, and interviewing them. Because yep. that's something that could really help people understand what's available to them. I, in the past, I've always written about the science and mm -hmm. the funding and the clearances. But now I'm thinking of writing about the implement, implementations of AI in real hospitals. And because mm -hmm. I already know a lot of the hospitals already, but just think if I had a whole list of every hospital in the world that's using AI and if it's um, if it's the default, like at, in those hospitals. Yeah, and how many, how many patients actually benefit? How do you actually use it? Yep. Yeah, because like yeah. the, the um, that AI program that was used to spot sex, sepsis, it was just the default. It was installed in the medical record system and no one had to ask for it. Every yeah. single person had that running in the background. And yes. I know that happens with um, AI doc. AI doc is a implementation to um, help fra with spot fractures. And that runs in the background in mm -hmm. a lot of hospitals that it's, it's working in. Yeah. So that, that would be really interesting. Yeah, and look, it's hard to do, right? Because I mean, J John Hopkins, one of the things they do really well is they integrate, right, computer science and medicine, right? Uh, so, so you can actually work, you know, on the hospital floor and get feedback. Uh, I mean, I know Mount Sinai also also does this well, but 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 really, they're, you know, that's the least, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's extremely hard to do in practice, right? Actually, mm -hmm. have those teams that work together, right? Get that feedback, right? Work as you say, until it actually gets to the patient, right? And look at clinical outcomes. Look at really UI feedback, right? And, and training people, absolutely. But you know, um, if hospitals knew or if patients knew how much money could be saved, they might be more interested. Because you know, at Stanford, they're using um, really ultra high performance um, gene sequencing that they use AI for. And mm -hmm. it costs between $4,000 and $7,000 per patient to sequence all their genes and diagnose a disease. And this is for hospitalized patients who are having an emergency. And um, it was, insurance covers it. Yeah. And in order to do traditional testing and keep those patients in the hospital would cost $10,000 a day. And this is so, this is half the price and it's done in um, five hours. Mm -hmm. So see, so if people understood, if hospitals, doctors and patients understood the time that could be saved and the money that can be saved by using AI, I think there would be a lot more adoption. Yeah, and then you know you you say you have it working in one hospital, five five thousand more to go, right? Just in the U.S. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Absolutely. I think a lot of people think that if hospitals and doctors use AI, it'll be more expensive because it's you know. So now the hardware is expensive um, to upgrade the hardware, and that's a lot of the um, AI. The problems with using AI in hospitals is the legacy hardware in the hospitals, but so that's why places like MIT and Stanford and University of Hawaii are doing so well. They have state-of-the-art hardware, ultra high performance hardware that supports mm -hmm. AI. So that, that is an area that, that hospitals have to work on. They have to get, and I mean, everything can be done in the cloud, but you still need hardware in the hospitals. Yep. You know, so um, that's, that is a, I don't want to make it seem easier than it is. There are, you know, there, there is going to be a difficult process, but I think it's in the long run, it'll save us a lot of money and a lot of time. And most importantly, it'll decrease suffering People will not have to suffer for so long while they're being diagnosed and treated. We it will become much, much. Um, it be that, well. We can comp compress the time it takes to screen for pro, you know yeah. diseases, diagnose and treat. All that can be compressed. Exactly. Look, I think no one is going to you know imagine that it's going to be easy. Uh, but then you know, I mean, half of us are going to get diagnosed with some kind of cancer in our life, right? Yeah, yeah. You know. And then become super personal, right? We're, like we're all on the clock, right? We need this to be implemented and implemented broadly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even if it's not cancer, a fracture, I mean, one of the biggest causes of death for older people is a fracture. Yep. If you, totally. yeah. So even finding, a, being able to screen for osteoporosis in advance 
and let people know if they have osteoporosis and treating that, we could avoid so many deaths and so much suffering yep. for, you know, because people become incapacitated if they break a leg or they, they, you know, break a bone. So yep. yeah, there, if, if we can use AI, we can really decrease the amount of suffering in the world. Definitely. For sure. Yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you know, with that hope, uh, thank you so much, Margarita, uh, Margarita, for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I sure think I've, you know, I've, I've learned a lot. And uh, it's uh, hard to talk about me. AI for just 15 minutes because there's so much, but it's yes. really nice to uh, have, have a chance to talk to you about this. Yep. So uh, thank you for, very much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, with that, everyone, thank you for joining us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you.